please scan the QR code for the attendance. Yeah, the four of analytical chemistry course is on sampling and sample preparation. Sampling is the process of collecting a representative sample for analysis. Real samples often require some degree of sample preparation to remove substances that interfere in the analysis of the desired analyte or to convert the analyte into a form suitable for analysis. The overall accuracy and reliability of the results largely depend on the proper collection of sample during the sampling process, transport of the sample from the point of collection to the analytical laboratory, the proper selection of the laboratory sample, and the sample method used to convert sample into a form suitable for the measurement step. The sampling and sample preparation process begins at the point of collection and extends to the measurement step. High uncertainty in any analytical step will increase the uncertainty of the overall chemical analysis. If we do not know the random error in the individual analysis, we can perform some trial analysis to establish error estimation. Thus, the need of applying statistics in choosing the number of replicates is crucial. In choosing the number of replicates, the equation derived from statistical equation for confidence interval where R is the relative standard deviation, X bar is the mean, T is student T value, S is standard deviation, and N is number of samples or trials or replicates. The value of N can first be approximated using T for the confidence limit required for infinite number of samples. At 95% level, T is equal to 1.96. The value of N from the first approximation rounded to the next higher integer can be put back into the equation to calculate the value of t. The new value of t can be used to recalculate the value of n. The procedure is repeated using the new values of t and n until the answer doesn't change. Let's look at the example of question. This question requires you to calculate the number of replicates with a 95% confidence given the mean is 4.3%, standard deviation 0.3% and relative standard deviation if 5% or 0.05. The value of R should be 0.05, not in percentage. For this question, first we assume the number of trial is infinity. Thus, the value of T is 1.96 from the student T table. Insert all the value into the equation, then you will get the number of trial n equals 7. After that, find the value of T at 95% confidence interval in T table when n is 7. You will find T equal 2.365. Again, Using the same equation, change the value of t, then you will get n equal to 11. The same step should be applied until the value of n doesn't change. Here, we get n equal 10 for 2 times. Thus, number of trials is 10. Sampling techniques. Suppose we have a shipload of ore that is composed of large and small heterogeneous particles and lumps. How would an analytical sample be taken? An appropriate approach is to take a representative sample from the conveyor belt that carries the ore into the plant all the way through a cross-section of the material. The segments or increments may be analyzed individually or collected to make a representative sample of the whole. As a general rule, for sampling large quantity of material on a conveyor belt or any continuous stream, the sampling should be taken at regular intervals and should be fixed in its form or method. A whole cross-section should be taken for each sample. For a pile of material, to obtain a random sample, the sampling must use identical methods. The choice of sampling method depends on a number of factors. 
First, the chemistry of the material to be assayed, the size of bulk sample, and the last one, the physical state of the fraction to be analyzed, whether they are crystalline solid, glassy solid, liquid, gas, etc. One of the most commonly used sampling method is by cone and quarter method. Suppose you have a pile of material to analyze. The following are the logical steps in the sampling. Divide the pile of material into quarters. It can at least be done through imagination since it is difficult to divide a few times sample pile. Take samples from each quarter of the pile. Crush these samples and form into a smaller conical pile. Flatten the conical pile and cut into equal quarters and the two opposite quarters are chosen at random. Crush the quarter further, mix it thoroughly and repile. The fixed procedures of cutting, randomly choosing opposite quarters, mixing and grinding and repiling are continued until the sample of the size needed for replicate samples in the laboratory is obtained. This technique minimizes bias in the sampling. If the samples are to be obtained from a large area, the sampling should be done at a regularly spaced point. You can use imaginary, identical rectangulars or hexagons will serve the purpose. Homogenization of samples. One of the treatments for a solid sample is homogenization. This can be carried out by crushing, pulverizing, grinding, rendering it into a thoroughly mixed powder. Subdividing and mixing a material increases the homogeneity of the sample. The smaller the particle size, the lower the error in analyzing a given width of material. Small particles enable us to minimize the number of particles in each reasonably sized sample while assuring they would mix well and thus minimizing variation in content between samples. Generally, small particles produce better samples. Why don't we grind the particles as finely as possible? In trying to obtain very fine particles, there is a tendency that the sample will be contaminated from the large amount of handling. Because of their lightweight and dust-like in nature, very fine particles can be difficult to handle and transfer. Samples should contain large number of particles because variation in content between individual samples in minimize and each sample should be more representative of the material. Ideally, sample integrity should not change from the time of sampling and the time of analysis. To ensure that, we need to understand the chemistries of all the components and the environment in which they will be stored. For example, some compounds are unstable and disintegrated in certain solvent. Thus, we need to consider the effect of some important factors such as time, temperature, humidity level, sample acidity, oxygen content, exposure to light. Another important aspect is the selection of containers. A good container serves to protect the sample and minimize contamination from other materials. In addition, containers must not contribute interferences, absorb or absorb analytes significantly. Problems related to sample integrity can be significantly reduced by performing in situ sampling where the analysis is carried out immediately and at the site of sampling. In situ sampling can be done with portable instruments or with online instrument that draws the sample from a process stream directly for analysis. The analyte of interest could be part of complex heterogeneous mixture. Therefore, it is often necessary to employ physical separation methods to effectively separate the analyte for further analysis. Several physical separation methods are given in this table. For example, Separation of liquid and light from solid matrix can be carried out by heat and trap, while the separation of liquid and light from liquid can be affected by distillation or by decantation, if the liquid are immiscible. Type of samples. Samples can be classified as gas, liquid and solid. There are numerous methods with different principles of sampling. The commonly used gas sampling methods include sampling bag, grab sampling, 
condensation, trapping by adsorption, headspace sampling, push and trap, and thermal extraction. The choice for gas sampling method depends on the analyte, the sample matrix, and the assay method to be used. Sample gases of interest may include permanent gases and vaporized volatile species. The latter includes compounds that are liquid at room temperature or pressure, but are gases at the temperature and pressure at which they are sampled, such as benzene and xylene. Liquid samples are much easier to prepare for analysis because the dissolution step is not necessary. Often of concern are matrix interferences, concentration of analyte, and compatibility of analyte with the analytical technique. Numerous techniques are available for liquid sample preparation. These include centrifugation, dilution, distillation, evaporation, filtration, liquid-liquid extraction, microdialysis, sedimentation, and solid phase extraction. Solid and semi-solids must be in a finely divided state to become more homogeneous and suitable for secondary sampling and dissolution process. Grinding is the most commonly used technique for reducing the size of hard solid samples. The classical mortar and pestle grinding method requires some manual physical effort. Caution should be exercised when grinding solid samples with extremely volatile compounds by minimizing the heat produced during the grinding process. Both classical and modern extraction methods are used in the preparation of solid sample. The classical extraction methods include dissolution, homogenization, solid-solid extraction, sonication, and chocolate extraction methods, many of which are still widely used in chemical analysis. The modern extraction methods include accelerated solvent extraction, microwave-assisted extraction, and supercritical fluid extraction. Focused microwave-assisted extraction is an attractive technique due to its rapidity, low solvent volume required, and its moderate investment. Under optimized condition, the modern extraction techniques have been shown as much efficient with similar relative standard deviation when applied to environmental analysis such as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon in sewage slush. Sample matrices can be classified as organic and inorganic. Organic matrices can be further classified as volatile, semi-volatile, and non-volatile. Organic samples also include biological samples, although they often require different sample preparation procedures. Sample preparation, also known as sample treatment or sample pretreatment, is a step in chemical analysis train where the sample is brought into the correct size and form for analysis. Sample preparation has three combined main objectives, namely to provide the sample component of interest in solution, free from interfering matrix elements, and at a concentration appropriate for detection and measurement. Sample preparation is still one of the most labor laborious, time-consuming, and error-prone steps in chemical analysis. Despite considerable advances in speed of analysis, resolution, and automation of analytical measurement techniques, and data handling and report generation software in the past several decades, Sample preparation, particularly its automation, has been rather neglected. A gas chromatography run may require only a few minutes, but preparation of the sample itself may take considerable time. Thus, reducing the sample preparation time or automation will reduce the analysis time and improve sample throughput. Ideal sample pretreatment methods should provide quantitative recovery, which is 99% percent of analytes of interest and a minimum number of steps. Quantitative recovery doesn't mean that all the analytes need to be included in the final determination. Minimum number of sample preparation steps can reduce the time and effort required and reduce accumulated errors. Expertise and skill in chemistry is also required to some degree no matter how simple or complex the procedures are. The general principles of sample preparation are Sample preparation should not lose any analyte. Bring the analyte into the best chemical form for assay method used. Remove interferences. Shouldn't add the inappropriate sample or cross-contamination. 
if necessary, dilute the sample or concentrate the sample. Optimization of chemical form. Samples received for analysis often contain moisture. Drying of sample can be an important step as the amount of moisture can significantly affect quantitation. A number of methods are used for drying. These include conventional gravity ovens, forced air ovens, equilibration in a desiccator oven and vacuum ovens, and infrared and microwave ovens. The most commonly method of drying is to heat the sample in an oven to constant weight. Biological samples shouldn't be heated over 100 degrees Celsius to avoid decomposition or destruction of the material. Many inorganic samples such as silica gel or soil need to be heated well above the boiling point of water to ensure the removal of moisture. We might assume that the weight loss during the drying step is due to loss of water. However, the weight loss may also due to other volatile organic analytes being lost. The goal of the drying process is to achieve the same base percentage of residual water and other volatile materials in each sample. If this is accomplished, all analysts will base their reports on the same sample basis. Separation and pre-concentration techniques. When the analyte is present in a matrix containing interfering species, there are three different ways to measure the analyte. First, use a selective analytical technique such as ion selective electrode. Perform selective derivatization of the analyte that quantitatively convert the analyte into another chemical species that can be measured more easily. And the last one, remove the analyte from the sample matrix by a separation or extraction process. Extraction and pre-concentration procedures serve two complementary goals. First, to improve sensitivity and another one is to eliminate part of the matrix. Pre-concentration by a factor of 10 to 100 or more is usually used in analytical chemistry to improve sensitivity. Common analyte separation processes include liquid-liquid extraction, liquid-solid absorption, and physical or mechanical separation methods such as precipitation, filtration, distillation, and chromatography. The analyte concentration often needs to be increased to a level where it can be measured more easily. This is frequently encountered in analysis that involve the measurement of trace amount of analytes. Dissolution. Unlike in most organic analytes, in most inorganic analytes, simple solvent cannot leach out trace elements. Thus, most inorganic analysis involve sample dissolution. Total sample dissolution is a quantitative process. We are often concerned with the total dissolution procedures. In elemental analysis, sample dissolution is the digestion or mineralization of a sample to render it soluble and to destroy organic matter or other metric materials that may interfere with the recovery of the analyte. Sample dissolution procedures can be divided into three categories. Dry ashing, oxidative ashing and wet oxidation. That's all for chapter 4. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.